thank you. Thanks to Eddie, Jim, Kevin, and Lars for uh, inviting me to talk. It's a wonderful occasion honoring uh, such a brilliant mind as Gary Becker. Um, like all of us who've uh, spoken here, Gary was hugely influential uh, and influential on my work, but perhaps in a more indirect way than for many of us who here. In fact, my first face-to-face uh, -face, uh, encounter with Gary was being asked to present at the Becker seminar. I'm glad you, Kevin, mentioned the word suffer. Uh, I was preparing uh, the introductory slide to give the introductory slide, expecting you know a regular sem seminar. But Gary was having none of that. He said straight to a question on page 29. And after, this is 30 years ago, I can still remember page 29. <laughs> it was a fantastic interchange. He got right to the heart of the paper. Uh, of course, you feel a little beaten up, but elated too. And a much, much better paper after that. Uh, in fact, that was the time when we were just starting building the empirical group at uh, UCL. And, uh, it was very timely to give uh, to be at that seminar because it really hugely influenced uh, the way we tried to set up the re research atmosphere and interchange in seminars at uh, in the department. And I think it, that um, that legacy still of Gary and that seminar still uh, lives on uh, in the department. Uh, of course, many trips here, all fantastic. Lots of interchange with uh, with Gary, Jim, and others. In particular, I think of. Uh, this, the, um, the wonderful conference that Eric Hurst ran, in fact, in 2010, uh, put together at BFI on household production. Uh, that's where I tried out some of the ideas I'm going to talk about today. And uh, Gary, in true form, was like in, in the front row like an excited student. Um, his influence, extraordinary. He was really extraordinary. Uh, you can see the way his work completely shifted the agenda at my own institute, the IFS, um, the family and human capital are now right in the center of the research agenda. And that's a real tribute to, uh, to Gary. In fact, it was only uh, about a year ago, uh, the last time I really interacted with Gary, that uh, we ran, uh, I helped run, in fact, a tax policy forum at BFI. And uh, Gary was uh, very engaged and involved at that, firing questions. Still difficult to think that he's not here. In fact, I did think about talking about tax and human capital. Maybe I should. But I then remembered back to a conversation I had with Gary uh, back, in fact, when he visited UCL in 2010 for the Solly meetings, which quite a few people here, Eddie and others, were at. Uh, a lot of fun. And uh, he became intrigued by uh, a, a kind of puzzle Gary likes puzzles, and uh, he's the one to solve them, too. And it was the puzzle you may be familiar with about the relationship between uh, income inequality and consumption inequality over the working life, which I certainly studied, and many others, too. And uh, there's a kind of puzzle there that uh, it looks like um, that families respond a little bit too little to very persistent shocks in the labor market. So get a very persistent shock, you'd think that would uh, change the consumption, perhaps, in the household. And it uh, doesn't seem to do quite as much as it should. And in conversation with Gary, he said very simply, well, why don't we just look at the way family time allocation works? Can that do anything? And in fact, we just thought about, uh, over coffee, how we put in a family labor supply model. And that's exactly what I'm going to talk about here. So at least it's a tribute to Gary. And uh, so let me tell you a little bit about this. This is joint work. I've been working with Luigi Pistafuri at uh, Stanford a long time on this. He's an ex-student from UCL. And Ita Supporter, who's now in Tel Aviv, uh, who was a student of, of Luigi's at Stanford. And uh, we have an earlier paper, and this work is uh, extending that. It's still. Um, bits of it are still in its infancy, but I'll give you a bit of background. In a sense, the question is very straightforward. It's um, it, it, how do families deal with uh, adverse or labor market shocks? Um, it's a pretty important question. Um, of course, Gary taught me and taught us all the importance of interactions within the family, time allocations, consumption expenditures, and that's going to be kind of key, more key than I thought. 
originally. As I said, they uh, turn out to be uh, central to understanding the mechanisms that families use. The, the idea here really is that um, you, you want to know how the family is reacting to shocks, because if you want to design policy, you can't do that in abstract. Uh, you have to know exactly what the family is doing, and then you put that together and think about how best to design policy. And uh, they also, of course, uh, and that was one of the motivations here. In fact, the motivation is to bring this all together. It also helped us understand the links between uh, different measures of uh, inequality and their evolution, largely over the working life I'm going to be thinking of here. Um, in fact, the way I tend to think of this is, you know, we're, th there's a lot of different measures of inequality out there at the family, household level, individual level. You think of uh, wages, um, and in fact, labor economists will work on wages. That's almost where they stop. Um, then you get uh, moving into earnings and, uh, and, and joint earnings. Um, these are economists who study household labor supply behavior. Through to family income, typically public economists there, and then right through to consumption. Unfortunately, consumption is often left to macroeconomists, very bizarrely. Uh, but the good thing about anything that's a tribute to Gary is that you don't have to worry about sticking with any field, and you can cover everything. And uh, that's the idea here, in fact, is to try and link these together in an interesting way. It's been part of the agenda, by the way, for a while. Uh, but what I wanted to do here was really go back to the primitive uncertainty of wages and think about how do they go through. The kind of puzzle was really looking at family income, disposable income perhaps, and thinking how it linked with consumption. And you might look at that and think, well, it's very linear. You know, if I know wages to earnings, and then I, I could do all these kind of separately, what's the, what's the point of bringing it all together? Well, think about it for a second. And of course, if there are interactions between what you do in the labor market, hours of work, or what you do at home, time spent on different activities at home, then they link to consumption. And of course, they cause a, a kind of disturbance in this nice linkage here. So if you really want to understand how wage shocks are going to affect consumption, you have to th think about, well, if wages affect the way allocations happen in the, in the household, because hours of work and hours, non-market hours, uh, between couples, say, you have to think then how it's going to affect their consumption allocations too, their consumption. And then you might stand a chance. Uh, it turns out this, is, this does work, and I'm going to try and convince you uh, that, in fact, if you put all these bits together, you get a pretty good description linking all these together, and you don't really need much more, which I've always thought is good, because uh, you could think about lots of other mechanisms that families might have for kind of smoothing some strange kind of insurance mechanisms that they could buy or, or, or some networks. But we know really deep down that they're not going to be of central importance. They're going to be quite important for some people, but they can't drive everything. And so that's the idea here. And, we, and the way I think about this is that all the linkages are, are, um, are kind of insurances. The way families react to these shocks is just a set of uh, the most general definition of an insurance you could think of. So we're going to have family labor supply or time allocations. And I say here it's going to be pretty simple, um, and, uh, but not completely simple. The, the standard labor supply model is not going to work here. You need a lot more interactions than you would normally have. There are kind of complementarities going on here that are unusual, uh, but they're quite important, in fact. Uh, the obvious one being among uh, family members, among couples. And that does quite a lot, in fact. Um, of course, not a lot of insurance. If your preferences are complementary, that's not going to help a huge amount. And uh, I'll show you how you can twist from complementary kind of preferences to still getting some insurance, which is really about substitution, in a way, or offsetting effects. But of course, we can't really do this in a vacuum. Uh, we need to think about. Um, taxation, because taxation can give you interactions that are really not about preferences directly. They're just about the way the tax system works, because after all, the, uh, the tax system in the US and many other countries often treats uh, family income as the base, the tax base. Um, and the, UK, the US is particularly uh, 
that has you know, joint taxation right the way through, really, from the way food stamps and EIT, EITC is, 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 um, is, uh, <coughs> is eligibility is set up right through to the taxation. UK, we have uh, joint taxation in, in benefits and welfare payments, but individual taxation in the personal tax system. These can, obviously, when you think about um, reactions to wages, you've got to place them through how, how after, tax, after tax wages, if you want, and then uh, dependencies there just by shifting you around on your marginal tax rate as somebody else changes can give you interactions that are, that are not really, you know, they're not really deep in preferences. They're about the way the system works. Naturally, you want to think about saving as well, assets, and that's going to be pretty key. Informal contracts, gifts, they're things that are pretty hard to measure. When we do measure them, they're not hugely important, at least for many households in their working life, uh, but we're going to model them as a kind of general as, as I've done before. The, the idea then is to think about how important are each of these mechanisms, how do they change over the life cycle, and then the policy question is that, you know, how do you design policy to best ensure those shocks? And uh, that I'm hardly going to touch on here, that's other work. Well, in addition to assets and taxes, what we're going to do is find a key role for the, the idea, basically, the Gary suggestion. It solves a kind of puzzle here. Um, there's a lot of work on family labor supply, of course, and, and, and much on the interaction with consumption. But it does a pretty good job here, and so I think it's important. Consumption inequality is, is, is pretty interesting um, for microeconomists as well as macroeconomists. And I always get, you know, here's a picture of the UK, cohorts in the UK, consumption inequality, just the variance of equivalized log consumption. And uh, if I take, you know, just done by uh, age here, if I take guys at age 40 and I look across the cohorts, uh, you can see younger cohorts have just got a lot more inequality in their consumption. Um, of course, over time, if cohorts are coming in and out, you can uh, see how that might look. Um, but you can also see that, that where cohorts start in, the, in the, at the beginning of their, life, their working life cycle, there's already a lot of inequality. And that I'm not going to address here a lot, but uh, you can, you know, the question of how much is that inequality in human capital, how much is that inequality in transferred wealth or finance is a key question. I'm going to be really looking at cohorts, following them through and seeing how they react. But there's a lot of key things here. And uh, you kind of, you know, that looks pretty much like a, it makes you comfortable with a life cycle model to see inequality going like that. Income doesn't go like that, by the way. So there are linkages are clearly between income and consumption, but it doesn't follow the same pattern. In fact, inequality at the household level in uh, income itself tends to fall back once people retire in that. But of course, consumption inequality, if you've got a, a half decent model in mind, should keep going and not fall back, and you saw it doesn't. So at least we've got some chance of a decent model working here. The US, this, and there's a lot of work on the US, this is just one thing that Arazio Atanasio and colleagues put together. We well, get this similar jump in variance of consumption. It's more difficult to go back in time in the US because there's not very good consumption measures, although I'm going to be looking at the US here just for fun, mainly. What do you, so how do we think about this in a really simple, so this is a halfway house model in Jim's style. It's going to be very kind of a, a pretty straight, straightforward. It's going to be a fairly, it's going to be an approximate estimation of uh, what families are doing here. But you're thinking of the transmission of shocks over the working life and the mechanisms. That's the, they're the kind of things here we want to and that's going to be, they're going to provide the linkages. So if you imagine doing an impulse response here, you know, you, you shock the distribution of wages or labor market shocks, and then you track out how things are changing over the working life in all these other dimensions. Uh, one finding that's pretty obvious when you think about it is that uh, it's key, really, to distinguish uh, the persistence of shocks, you know. Persistent shocks are hard for people to self-insure. Assets don't go very far if you're young and you have a persistent change in your potential, pro in say your labor market productivity. It just, uh, and you're going to see that. So how do fam families deal with that? Do they just take it as a cut in consumption? Or what's going on? That's going to be the key here. One thing that, that we've learned just um, 
studying the kinds of shocks that happen within families over the working life is that you really need to uh, allow these to vary with age, with education. We saw some of that in Piandre's talk. In fact, there's some similarities here in a loose sense. <clears throat> of course, much data is, um, it's, the, the panels that we have are kind of rather small to really dig into this. And uh, I've been working with a colleague here, Magni Mogstad, on Norwegian panel. And it's kind of interesting, the things we found there are going to hold up in many different economic circumstances. But the, ooh, going the wrong way. The, if you think about the variance over the life cycle of the persistent component, so I won't go into great detail how we're identifying that, but just think of it as, a, as getting the, the persistent component to earning shocks here. You can see overall it seems to have a U-shape in there. This is by age of uh, families, working age families in Norway. Um, uh, one interesting thing in that paper that we've done together is that we, it's an insurance paper too. It's looking at how well the uh, tax and welfare system in Norway uh, deals with those kind of shocks. That's the kind of key idea of all this work. You see that for everyone. If you look at uh, low skilled in Norway, you can see um, the, the, the dotted line is what happens after, that's to the variance of per persistent shocks to their income after you t allow for a tax system. And uh, you can see it just pretty much flattens the whole thing out and really cuts it down. Uh, this is a kind of neat idea. Of course, the, the, y y you can imagine if the welfare system is doing everything for you, the family doesn't really have to do much. And one thing we found in the Norwegian data is the family doesn't do much. There's hardly any insurance going on within the family, but you can see why. There's no need to. Uh, other economies, the US, the UK, um, the system isn't quite as generous as that, and families are going to have to do something themselves, and that's what we're going to look at here. So the mechanisms we look at in this work are, are just the obvious ones. This is all pretty straightforward. It kind of works. Uh, joint labor supply, the nonlinear taxes, government transfers, as far as we can, savings. We're going to, what I'm going to do is present work uh, um, using the PSID that um, a number of people have been looking at. And it's partly just to point out the PSID is historic, but still pretty good, actually. It's small. This is not big data. Uh, but it's, it's kind of useful data. Um, and what happened in the last six waves of the PSID, it's every two, two years now, is there's a lot more detail in consumption. In fact, phenomenally more detail. More recently, I'm going to just use the, uh, the waves since 96, 96 uh, which have pretty much 70% of the budget and detail of some of that. The ASIC data is much better. Uh, the, you can pretty much find out uh, how much net equity there is in the home, which is pretty key. We find that to be quite important. And you can imagine uh, going over time and over someone's life cycle, the value of the home isn't particularly the key thing. It's the value of your net equity in the home. And uh, you get pretty good measures of outstanding mortgage debt, outstanding financial debt, total financial assets, and total house value. And so you can construct different measures of the assets available to this family at a particular time. And that's pretty important. And I know, I really don't know any other data set that puts all these bits together, actually, in such a nice way. And so it's going to be useful for this, although we're doing this work on lots of other data sets as well. But it does allow us to really focus um, it, on these uh, interactions. I call them kind of Becker non-interactions, but they're just non-separabilities here in this. Because what I'm not going to be doing is using the time use data. So Eric will be upset about that. But there is kind of interesting time use data. And given the results I'm going to show you, particularly the time use data in the PSID on time spent with children, it would be incredibly, and that's the next step, hopefully very soon, to uh, use that. The data, well, there's a bit of description. But just to point out, there are now lots of uh, items uh, of expenditure. If you remember the old PSID had food in, food out, pretty poorly measured, actually. Now we've got a, a, a pretty systematic coverage. I haven't really got time to go through all this. We're going to select, um, for the baseline work here, we're selecting pretty boring households. 
They're kind of couples, they're reasonably stable in the middle of their working life just to get a handle on what's going on here. It would be, uh, and that's why the total sample size in each year is around 2,000. Um, uh, and we've got uh, detail on assets, on uh, first and second earners, participation rate. For this particular group, the, uh, the, the, the head doesn't, the, the head, the, the male doesn't really have much, there's very little non-participation over the whole year. Of course, we're looking at, we're going to look at working hours over the whole year. That's the measure here. There's lots of issues with the measures, but I, I'm trying to convince you can learn quite a lot from here. So the wage process um, is going to be also very simple, and it's certainly not where I would stop. Uh, you're just thinking of uh, wages for the time being. Just think of wages evolving according to some a variety of observed characteristics, x's, some transitory shocks, which are going to difference the u's, and then a persistent shock. This is standard, you know, transitory permanent model. I must say, with another colleague here, um, uh, Stefan Bonhomme, we've been looking at this model, but with much more non-linearity, and it is pretty key. One, one result we've found there is that big shocks tend to have more mean reversion, and this doesn't allow that. So there's some things that this doesn't quite get right, but it's interesting. And we're going to allow this to be, um, to be some correlation. So this is where it gets a little closer, more interesting, because we allow correlation in the family between the shocks, and uh, that's going to be important. So we allow the variances to differ across life cycles, so different periods, different education age groups are getting different drawing from different variances, different shocks, and there's correlation. Is it negative or is it positive? Uh, we know it's positive, of course. You never find any insurance on the shocks. It's not as, quite as positive as I first thought, by the way. Here's the baseline group, uh, young, college educated. Uh, but nonetheless, if you look at the covariance or correlation in the row, kind of 0.2, 0.1, it's not that strong. It is significant. Um, so if you're looking for insurance by people, you know, matching with people who have negatively correlated shocks, you're not going to find it here. And it doesn't, you know, given the discussion yesterday, it's hardly the way we think of matching in marriage. Um, and, and by the way, we're going to find quite a lot of complementarity too. So it's going to be hard to find insurance in this, in this world. Uh, but we still find it, and uh, that's going to be the fun. So the household is going to choose its consumption. Spendage is a pretty rational kind of choice model here. At the moment, it's just a pooled model. It's not a collective model, though in a sense it's fairly, it's, it's really a descriptive model, and uh, we're hardly using any of the, the, we're not doing any welfare analysis here. There's no, um, and uh, so we're not really buying into any particularly difficult model. We're going to um, note that uh, we're going to allow, this is where the complicated um, interactions happen. Uh, labor supply, so often when you write down a model, certainly many macro models, um, you just get a, what we'd say additivity, substitution for sure. Just, you know, things have to be substitutes. Um, we're going to allow for complements, and that's going to be key here. And the, the, the key about this is that the, the new bit, in a way, is that whether you get complementarity or not depends on the family structure. And this is the kind of uh, underlying the kind of Becker idea, I guess, is that you can imagine when you have young children, uh, childcare is pretty important. That's, one, that's a kind of expenditure too, and that's going to give you an interesting relationship between hours, of, uh, hours and expenditure, like I was saying. But also, within the household, you only need, you know, one of you can do the childcare, at least that's my experience. And, uh, and so you do, in fact, find uh, quite strong substitution there overall. But as soon as children get older, you revert to complementarity. And so, of course, we'd like to dig more into the detail of that uh, because there are different activities. And it's, it's a little bizarre that I'm not writing down the full activity model of a Becker model. But you still get the, the, the idea here that um, you know, when, you're not, when you're doing more leisure type activities or activities, uh, then complementarity is, is going to be, you like being with the person you you like enjoying those things together. But ch with young children, that tends to not happen so much. So you get this reversion, and that's kind of interesting. Uh, I'm going to focus on, actually on the other, the complementarity case, because that's the unusual case, because in the standard additive model, you would get, you know, some substitution anyway. Um, but even if you've got complements, of course, if you're thinking of a persistent shock, this is a time... Uh, a lifetime model, we think of Frisch, Marshall. Frisch is just the kind of within period, 
complementarity in any period, call it fresh if you want. Marshall is about, or at least the way I interpret it, is about the persistent shock because it's going to have the wealth effect, income effect in two. And interestingly, they're not huge effects, but they're just enough to do the work that Frisch complements always, even when there's Frisch complements, you always get Marshall substitution. Uh, so, and that's going to be, you know, to this is economics 101, that's the reason you get insurance, because it's kind of turning around the effect. So the persistent shock is always going to result, or on average, it's going to result in, uh, in some labor market behavior that's going to offset the drop in consumption that would otherwise occur. And, uh, and, you know, that's rather like the added worker effect, but now you're picking it, because in a standard static added worker effect, you don't, you don't, it doesn't really allow you to, to have complementarity at the same time as this insurance, but you can here because of the, of the, of the um, lifetime kind of model. Consumption allocations as well uh, can be substitutes and complements. You can see why, and uh, that's going to happen. And... Uh, so how does the model, this is a very simple, the model, if it's completely separable, then all we're going to do, this is the kind of halfway house type model, relate changes in hours and employment and things like that. I'll just take the hours model here. And overall consumption, we can take consumption down into its elements. I'll talk a little bit about that too. Separable model, you're going to get the kind of fresh effects and the Marshall effects. The Vs are the persistent effects. And so a V on a, on a labor supply, a VJ on an HJ, if you get a persistent effect to your uh, wage, um, how do you react in the labor market? Okay. Um, and that would be an example. But just think about the kind of the interesting one we're on here is that a persistent shock to wages, a V, how does it change consumption? Just grouping consumption together, but allowing them to be non-separable. Um, think about it with, here. This is a separable case, of course. The, fir the first thing you've got to allow for is assets, um, because this shock is affecting your human wealth going forward. And the amount you can offset it depends on how much your human wealth can be offset by your assets. Of course, if you're young, there's not much offsetting to be done. So you need a half-decent measure of this ratio, assets to assets, net assets to net assets plus human wealth. And, and the, we can do that in the PSID, at least to some extent. We can measure assets, net assets, to a degree. It's going to be pretty important, actually. And then using the earnings model, kind of reduced form earnings model, we can get an idea of the human wealth going forward. So, um, and that's going to be important. They're all individual effects here. Of course, the other thing that matters is your share in your household income. Uh, you, you get a shock, but how important is your income in the household? That's the kind of S ratio your human wealth to other human wealth in the household going forward, expect it. Okay, so again, pretty simple. But these are going to be key. And then all the effects, the kind of interactions happen through the consumption and labor supply responses. I can't really go into much more detail than that, but that's the idea. Once you allow for non-separability, there are all kinds of interactions, and uh, that's going to be the key thing. And we allow the parameters to vary with characteristics. Joint taxation and government transfers are layered over this so you can get some interactions. Um, and, and we're going to do that. Kind of human wealth, um, you know, if you look in the data, of course, human wealth, we take the couples where the guy's human wealth, that's kind of looking forward, relative share of income. And you can see that it kind of peaks around 40 on average, then declines as, as the woman comes back into the labor market. It's always above, more, you know, in, on average above 0.6. But there's a whole distribution of that. Because in the data we've got, we can kind of look at individuals and the whole distribution of those things. Similarly, for, um, for pi, for this assets measure, you get a, a, a pi that's, of course, very low even on average when... Uh, when families are young, they don't really have much assets relative to their human, their human capital is much more important than their assets. That changes as they get older. Of course, they've got other assets they can draw on, and that's important. And again, there's a whole distribution of that. There's some households that are just popping along at the bottom with no assets. That might be a kind of rational choice. We're not going to model assets here. This is partial in that sense. We're just going to note that they're getting it. They have low assets. A shock comes along. How do they deal with it? And that's going to be the key. But other households have got, you know, they're, they're really right up there in the asset distribution, as we know. And they can deal with shocks later on in their life cycle very easily. If you look at the model, and again, I, there's a lot of 
uh, of results here. I'm not going to go through it. There are two takeaway things here. This just tells you about the elasticities. This is the kind of standard labor supply model with no interactions. It just blown away the data. You just never can accept this model. You need some non-separabilities. Uh, we know that. We've found that many times before. They're kind of interesting. This is for the child greater than five group, and you see that's where the complementarity is coming in between the labor supplies, for example. Kind of nice. And uh, all, all these interactions get rejected. We have an outside parameter here, um, beta, which is kind of covering the bit we don't, we don't model very well, kind of networks, just things. It's almost like a residual, really. Um, it turns out once you've got non separability, you could set that to zero. It's not saying there's no other network effects. But with this model, you can, the, you can really relate uh, the shocks of wages and all those things right through to consumption in a pretty reasonable way. Um, and that model is certainly not rejected by the data. As I said, male and female non-market time couples sometimes fresh complements, but always refer well reversed when there's young children that come substitutes, kind of nice, um, and uh, still get insurance even when they're complements because of the Marshall effects. And similarly with consumption, you could you can break down food out, child care, transport, utilities. You can see how they're going to go different ways. You know, as you work more, you probably need more child care if you have a young child, but you don't use utilities at home so much, so you can have complements and substitutes. And overall, in consumption, that can flip things around, and we do a lot of work now trying to pick that out. Um, Marshall, just a few things on the day. You know, there's nothing surprising here, though. Underlying it, they're just the things we, which is kind of handy. I've estimated a lot of Marshall elasticities uh, for labor supply. They're the important ones often for tax policy. And, you know, men are pretty close to zero. Women, on average, about 0.3. There's a whole distribution of those because, you know, it's going to vary with the heterogeneity in the data. Quite of important. These are the reactions, though, that individuals are going to make. But let me take you to the insurance part, and that's, that's really the key, the last part. So if you kind of imagine um, thinking about what happens in the family when the guy, this is the, the, the male, uh, takes, uh, and the labor supplies do differ across within the couple, so it's important to see. The guy takes a 10% a, a permanent shock in their wages, let's say. What do we see here? This is on average here. Take a young guy, 35. The first, well, they're about 70, on average, about 70% of future human wealth. And so it's, the 10% becomes seven already. And that taxes do a little bit of work. There's some nonlinearity, if they're completely proportional, because they do nothing here. But there's nonlinearity in the US tax system that's, that for, even for these kind of middling, this on average, you get some effect. Labor supply does all the rest. Sorry? What's on the vertical axis? A, a vertical axis. The percentage drop in consumption. So if it, if it was, if, um, if you did this to hold, you know, so uh, that's why you get a 7%, because on average, it's just, so the, you know, the guy is, is worth 70% 70, 70 of, the, uh, of the income. And it's a 10% fall, so it's, it's 7 Taxes reduce that a bit. Um, and in fact, that 10% that drop in male wages only translates into a, just about a 3.5% drop in consumption because of all these mechanisms. And you can see assets, that's the difference between the blue and the green line, are doing nothing on average for these guys. The big difference, and this is a kind of surprise, is that that's, that's the labor supply of the spouse doing some work here, especially when the families have little assets. And... Uh, and that's going to be key. In fact, if you, if you, if you take them out into their, the model we actually have estimated here, I finished it at age 59 to get around the retirement thing, but you can just take it out. And then, of course, the assets become very important uh, because people are going to use their assets to do a lot more insurance. That's the difference between the green and the blue line really kick in here. And, uh, but, and then there's a whole distribution of those because what we're trying to do is link distributions. So we're going to do, take these shocks and pass them through into consumption because different households are going to have different levels of ability through taxes, through their assets, through their labor supply, reactions depending on whether they have children and all of that. So it's kind of interesting. Particularly if you took, this is a kind of specific group, but take the group that were eligible for food stamps last period, T minus uh, two. They, they've just got no assets almost by definition. <laughs> Uh, I don't know how 
how closely the acid test in food stamps is, 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 is used, but they, they don't have acids. Um, the, the, ta the food stamps, the transfer system, is doing a lot of work here. It's really uh, doing more than half of the insurance. Of course, it, it is. There's, yeah, there's, there's um, some EITC here. There's food stamps all piling up. Important there. There's still a bit of labor supply going on, too. Nothing in the uh, standard kind of credit market here for these guys. And that's the kind of way we think of putting that together. In fact, I won't have to, but if you think, if you do this for women, the opposite, if women take a persistent shock, men do much less insurance on, in terms of their labor supply in the household. That's just the way it seems to pan out. There's some, but much less. That reflects what we know, and that is the elasticities are just a little different. Um, and that's, that's really it. Uh, to, a bit of a short summary of it. But the, um, the idea here is, is you know, to, to kind of take a puzzle in, uh, and just, you, you just add in this interactions in the family. It does do a lot of work. I'm over, it's the last slide. And uh, it's a key mechanism. I kind of thought it might be, but, I, you know, it's interesting that it's there. It only really gets um, interestingly key when you put in these interactions. You have to allow for this complementarity. In fact, if you just have the standard additive model, you just don't get all the insurance that we're seeing here. It just doesn't line up very well. So it's those kind of interactions. I'll call them Becker-Gorman non-separabilities, uh, just to, be, to acknowledge my old uh, influences. So there's an essential non-separability, and uh, that's going to be key here. But once you allow for this, at least for the kind of middling households in this um, PSID sample, you get taxes, assets, and uh, you, can, you don't really need to find other insurance mechanisms. There's not, after all, what, what are they going to access? There's very little else going on. And that's kind of pleasant to me, because now I can explain things without having to kind of account for it by some, um, you know, by some uh, residual thing that I don't really understand. And uh, we can begin to pan. So of course, there's more to be done. There's better panel data. There's the measures of time use, which I didn't realize were quite, there, there's a very nice sub-component sub in the PSID on time use with children. And that must be our next thing to look at here. And to, of course, we really haven't, which is a tragedy in a Becker symposium to uh, really ignore most of what's going on with family formation, and that would be interesting to do. But still, thanks to Gary for those wonderful insights and for everything. In a couple questions. One is, when you look at the heterogeneity, you estimate the heterogeneity, I was just wondering what parameters you allow for distributions of and which yeah. ones are kind of... Yeah directly informed by, say, those ratios that you calculated that would yeah. be kind of implied by holding those other parameters fixed and varying those ratios. And then the other question I had is, when you look at people who have really extreme shocks, it seems like extended family is an important insurance mechanism in the U.S. That is, the people who have prolonged periods out of the labor market often live with their siblings or parents and things like that. And I just wondered if you had any comments on whether those are people who jump out of your sample or are those just people who are in a different category almost from the beginning. And just wondering how you might think about bringing yeah. that in because when I've looked at people who are in that long-term out of the labor force group, often they're in, in, in extended family relationships as opposed to with a spouse. Thanks. Shall I? Yeah, yeah, let me. So great. Actually, most of the heterogeneity is in pi, the asset ratio, the rate. You know, it's a pretty simple model here, and, uh, and demographics, um, you know, numbers of children and the family structure. We're looking at families that have two adults uh, and or not children. Um, the, obviously, the extended family, especially for young adults in the labor market, I guess Greg Kaplan has his JPE paper. Is uh, on looking at moving back home. That's a kind of key insurance for young. We look. We kind of look at where the the, the, the age of the of the male, which is the kind of way we're aging the household, is um, in in this particular thing from 27, 28. I think from 28 onwards. And so you're missing a little bit of that moving back home. 
but you, you, you know we're not dealing with that, and I think it could be it could be key. Uh, another thing we'd like you know it's obvious to look at here is these shocks. How do they affect family formation? And it's it's you know it's been crying out to look at. It's a very simple thing to do, but it's the first order thing you might look at, and we we yet to, we've yet to do that. So you mentioned macroeconomics. In these type of studies, is there any hope at looking at responses to macroeconomic shocks? You know that might be, you know that might affect. Uh, the overall wage distribution from the macroeconomy, or, or it might affect asset uh, po you know, return possibilities, or you know how houses are valued, or stuff like this. Is, or, or is that, or those effects so tiny that it, that, that it's <laughs> important to put them in the background? Yeah, macro things are so unimportant. No, <laughs> not, not at all. <laughs> Um, so, in, in fact, I did originally, well, we haven't really placed this, but naturally, if you have a kind of exogenous shock to house prices, for example, it has a key effect here, because, and that's, the, that, that's wonderful. And uh, if that's all that, you know, if that, you could look at that, because it suddenly uh, takes down that insurance. So if you have a, a, a net equity fall in your house, in your housing equity, in the, in the model as we've got it here, um, that really reduces your ability to insure, uh, of course, and uh, and that would have a you know that would then click through to consumption any shock. Of course, the, the the great thing to look at is a combination of an asset price shock and a labor market shock. That's the kind of double whammy for these households because uh, then they get a persistent shock to one of the, the you know the labor market and they and their asset values fall. That that's kind of there. The reason I've hesitated a bit from that, in fact, we're not running this on the recession sample, is because we don't have any, you know, we're not looking at, it's not a frictions model. And so I get a little, little worried that, um, you know, there are things we're kind of missing here. But if you had, if you were looking at the regular times in the economy, perhaps the kind of sample we've got, and you thought of a persistent shock that happened to be correlated with a local, a local, um, shock to house prices, that, that would be, it. so those kind of local macro shocks rather than uh, kind of perhaps global effects in the economy. Yeah, that, 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 that in a way is what I had in mind when we were beginning to do that. I think that's potentially pretty exciting, actually. Yeah. Okay, one more Thanks. question, Dean. Dean uh, so I think it's very interesting, um, and I'm glad to hear you uh, say that you're gonna extend it to family composition, because it seems to me that when you've got a shock, that one of the things about your sample is, the shock itself is going to drive family dissolution, and yeah. so you're, you're sort of estimating forward parameters based on a selected sample. So clearly, yeah. you're aware that you have to sort of push in that yeah. direction. Yeah. The other thing, though, is it seems to me that there's more information in the PSID that you haven't yet exploited in things like transfers from family members, for example, are measured every year in the PSID. Household composition would get directly at the the thing that that uh, Kevin was raising, where you could actually see how people use the opportunity to live with family members to to uh, insure against the shock. So it seems like there's a lot that you could do with the data yeah. moving ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, complete. You know, this this kind of it's it's we're using a, a it's a nonlinear kind of model it's a nonlinear gmm type thing we're doing here but it's fundamentally linear and uh in the end i think what we're thinking here is the next step is you know we're just going to have to it's a bit like the debate with jim yesterday there's it, it, for some of these things you're just going to have to take a little bit more of a structural leap a dynamic structural leap forward and in fact ita is is working on that now for a number of aspects uh, particularly the thing you're thinking of here which is the kind of family formation thing we haven't started that there but you can see that that kind of discreteness you could look at how shocks affect it but if you really want to build it in that kind of discreteness isn't going to fit in particularly well with this kind of um, this this uh, econometric formulation as I've got it I still feel this is quite you know it's kind of useful because you, you learn a lot from it but it, it you know that's potentially uh, really really important here yeah, I completely acknowledge that. The transfers and family, that sounds great. I think there is some work now. Is Alessandra here? I think Luigi and Alessandra have a, a looking at transfer, you know, shocks and transfers, because the PSID has always been pretty good at that. And now it's, it's getting really good at that, because you could tie that up with consumption as well. So obviously looking at transfers and then the impact on consumption in this sample would be terrific. My guess is that's already 
on the, uh, 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 an active research agenda by people around here, but um, it certainly should be. It's good. Thanks.